Uh, good evening. Welcome to the Thursday, January 20th, 2011 uh, Board of Education budget meeting, a special meeting. Uh, item number one, call to order. We have Mr. Liu here, Mrs. Brand. Mrs. Dow won't be here tonight. She had an accident. Um, she's okay, but she won't be here tonight. Uh, Mrs. Iacono is here. Mrs. Uh, Albin is on her way. She had a, an education meeting up in the Hartford area. She should be here by 8. We have Mr. Carey and uh, Mr. Fatabee. So will everyone stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, and I also, for the record, forgot to mention Mrs. Zahn. She still is out of town attending to a, a relative who has been ill, so we wish her well. Um, so now we are on item number three, discussion of the superintendent's recommended 2011-2012 budget request. At our last meeting, uh, the superintendent presented the budget, and we um, started uh, our analysis of the budget with our questioning and that's what we're going to continue to do tonight and of course on Tuesday uh, our next meeting we will be voting on the budget uh, and at that time the public will have an opportunity uh, to weigh in on the budget uh, with public comment obviously uh, if you have any um, things you want to tell us you can email us call us up uh, and we will certainly take those uh, comments and suggestions into consideration. So uh, again on item three and I will look to board members to see if any board members have any discussions, questions, comments on the budget. Anybody? You want to go first? Mr. Carey, you ready? Uh, give me about five. Five? <laughs> Well, Mr. Liu. I wanted just to ask uh, Dr. Title a little bit about the ECC. Um, can you go over again your reasons for increasing in the future, I believe? It's not going to happen this year, is it? The, to include the third th three-year-olds, three is that right? Yeah, the plan would be um, at the pre-K program starting in this September in, okay. to um, um, have the programs be a mix of three-year-olds and four-year-olds. And the reason for that is that um, in the early childhood area, um, and having opened two early childhood magnet schools, I've <laughs> done a lot of this, um, it's very common and considered to be good practice to have mixed age um, group in an early childhood program um, for several reasons, but um, one of which is that um, it gives us an opportunity to have children um, under our care for two years instead of one. And if we're truly trying to get children ready for kindergarten who need it, then um, two years is better than one. And the second thing is that at the end of each year, then half the children are returning and know the routines. Um, and the teacher then doesn't need to restart with all the routines with the whole class, and you have some kids that can be role models and, and this sort of thing. So um, works out really well. Um, you know, even within the chronological age of three and four, kids mature at different rates, obviously. And so um, you have a range of maturity levels in an early childhood class um, to begin with. But um, skilled early childhood teachers um, actually welcome, I, in, in, in most cases, the opportunity to teach three- and four-year-olds. So that would be the plan. Um, so for example, if the Burr program next year were to have, say, 16 students in the morning and 16 in the afternoon, then the, the goal would be to have eight three-year-olds and eight four-year-olds morning and afternoon. And is this change going to impact our budget? Or how is The three- and four-year-olds versus yeah. just the four-year-olds? Yeah. No, it has no impact on the budget at all no because you're you're servicing say 16 children whether they're eight three-year-olds or eight four-year-olds mm -hmm. um, won't make any difference in terms of the um, budget what about if it grows just by having more kids being able to be a, in 
be included in this program? Would we have to find more possible space? Well, we're building it, the capacity, based on the space we have. Okay. Right? In other words, so um, the, the BERT program can be grown because the BERT program is in a regular size classroom, whereas the McKinley program is in about a half size classroom. Okay. So we couldn't grow the McKinley program even if we kept it. Right. Um, so, look, I'm a big pre K believer. If there were a way to expand pre K services down the road, um, that's something I'm interested in, but there's budget and, and facility limits to that um, that make that impractical. So really, I think we're, we're going to get um, more bang for our buck. We're going to service more children pre-K uh, in the existing spaces and actually, um, but by consolidating programs, saving money. Um, Mrs. Brand brought up a, a very interesting point the other evening about the ECC that's currently at Ward. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's something that we should take a look at in the future because if we're having problems with the high school enrollment in terms of space, but we're taking up space with the early childhood program at Ward, wouldn't moving that program to a different space, I'm not necessarily saying I know where that space would be right now, <laughs> right, but <laughs> Wouldn't that help us? Right. Hypothetically, that should help us in the future, especially going into further budgets. And I guess I'm a little concerned about uh, improving that playground without looking further into where we should possibly move this program when we need room at the high school. Mm. Well, I, I think. It's certainly something we can examine in terms of, you know, I mean, Mrs. Brand mentioned the space. And, um, you know, whether that's really available or not, I don't know. I mean, you'd be having to look at, you know, several different cost factors to expand the ECC or, or move it. One would be, of course, acquiring space and renovating it to fit the needs of early childhood. The space that we have at Ward is wonderful. When that was renovated, that was done beautifully for this purpose, for early childhood. Um, it's a magnificent um, facility. When I visited, I said, oh my God, this is like a gem. We need to utilize this more. Um, so to replicate that space, let's just say, forget expanding it for the time being, replicating that space somewhere else would require either acquisition of property or renovation of property, which is going to bump up against other demands for our limited capital dollars, right. uh, to put it mildly, uh, kindly. Um, the second uh, cost, um, would be then you would be incurring a cost, you know, undetermined to re-renovate that space to make it suitable for high school students. Um, and I don't know what that would be, but, you know, we can't just simply take the space as is there and say, okay, we're going to go teach calculus in a room that's been designed for three-year-olds. So it would be, uh, just as an example, um, and, and so, um, I think we'd be running into some, you know, we'd have to determine, you know, what those costs would be. Um, it could be that there are other less expensive ways of renovating space or, you know, to create room at the high schools than that one. Um, I would love to expand our pre-K programming. Um, I just, at this point, our budget can't sustain it, I don't think, at least not this year and probably not for the next couple of years. I mean, I, I think I would like to um, expand it as well, but I'm also very, very concerned about the, the high school. Um, I know that Ludlow is really having, is going to have problems, and if Ward is there as well, we should be right. taking a look at it. My, my, I guess my thought would be is that before we start to renovate a uh, early childhood playground, even for this smaller amount of money, we should uh, postpone looking into the future about what we could do to find a space for the early childhood center to bet and to possibly better utilize what we have at the high school level to keep the high schoolers mm -hmm. in one's place. Well, there's two, um, there are two parts to the playground um, project at um, DCC. And by the way, the, the ward space crunch is not going to be as difficult as the Ludlow space crunch based on the numbers of kids moving through. 
I mean, we're still going to have a Space Crunch award, but it's not going to be nearly what it will be at Ludlow. Um, there's an existing playground there mm -hmm. um, that needs to be resurfaced to make it truly handicapped accessible. It's just a rocky surface. It's uh, it really what it needs is a, a rubberized kind of a surface. Um, and, you know, that's right now really restricting a number of kids since the program services children with disabilities. To have a playground that doesn't fully service kids with disabilities, even if it's only going to be a year or two, to me, it's not a good message. Um, the second part of that, and again, these don't have to be both done. It could be one or the other. The second part is expanding the playground back toward the school. There's like a courtyard there. Um, and that would be an additional expense. So those could be separated. And if we were concerned um, and had to pick one you know, or the other, then I would pick doing the surfacing of it. Um, we combined them in part because um, if you're going to go in there and do some work and hire a contractor, you get better pricing and so forth. And um, it's a capital project. It's got to hit a certain threshold. So that, that's, um, you know, my, 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 sort of just so I'm clear, there's two parts to that project. <laughs> um, the other possibility, I think I had mentioned earlier that, um, earlier meaning whenever it was, Tuesday. Tuesday, right. Today is Thursday, right. Um, I mentioned that um, often when um, programs such as this one, if we institute a tuition charge, a sc sliding scale tuition charge for the typical peers, that often that money is plowed back into the program. Um, that that could be a source of funding to at least get the, you know, rubberized playground on that perhaps if we could put together, um, get, collect enough in tuition that we could pay for that part of it mm -hmm. uh, out of the, out of the, tu out of, out of the uh, tuition. And then the parents who are paying the tuition would see a benefit, you know, direct benefit from that. And when I met with the parents of that program um, with the director, um, you know, they talked about wanting to participate and, and help with that as parents in this town are great about doing, but it's a very small parent group there and, right. you know, they're not really able to raise that kind of money as a group. So um, there's some other ways perhaps we could, you know, we could help with that. But I'm very concerned, you know, when I saw that playground that it really doesn't serve handicapped <coughs> children well and that's what the program is. Yeah. I mean, I'm so I'm very concerned too. I think it's very much what we have on our plate now in terms of, you know, we're looking at all these possible future audit things, and yet we're saying, well, we don't want to rush into them. Uh, we need to take our time to make sure we do it correctly, and I agree with that 100 percent. I guess that's a little bit of my same feeling with this, in that uh, as much as this is needed, uh, I mean, there are so many things that are needed. Do we rush ahead with this? Um, or do we sort of take that time to figure out where the t pieces need to go? Um, because I'm at the capital project part? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's something um, that, It's a small guess, amount, but, yeah. you know, it's It's still in that list. It's yeah. in the, that's not part of the operating budget, though. No, right? no, that's I know. That, that'd be just, part of the discussion <clears throat> about the uh, capital, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Good. Um, um, got it. So moving on, my other question would be about, unless... Can you, are you going to go on another subject? I was going to, but I don't I have, have to. Uh, I have Mrs. Iacono, and I have a question about this, too. Um, I know I've said it before at the table, but I sit on the board of directors of a local pre preschool, and, and I know how important um, these um, pre-K programs are. Um, and I fully support the efforts to bring this together and enrich the program. I think it's really, really vital to the community. I wish we could do more. I wish we had the money and the space to do this potentially at every elementary school. Um, we're just not there, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, Dr. Title, if I'm understanding you correctly, this really isn't about expanding the playground because of um, the expansion to the population of the program that you're proposing. It's really um, a safety concern. It's really um, an effort to um, um, equalize it for those children that have disabilities. Um, is, is that correct? Is that yeah, a there's good summation? Even if we didn't expand the number of children in the program, the we playground we have there is insufficient. Okay. Okay, but um, that would be another, if we're going to add some more children there, then it makes it even more pressing that we right. 
that we do that. And, uh, and in the off hours, our, pl pro our playgrounds are available to um, other um, members of the community, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah, they're not locked. And if I remember correctly, um, a former board member, um, Brenda Kupchak, when she was a representative to the um, Parks and Recs Commission, they were working on building a playground um, for children with disabilities in town because one does not exist. Um, so I think that this would fit nicely into the community as a place that um, people could access in the off hours of the school day. Um, so it's an added benefit not only for the children that are using the preschool, but it's a benefit for the community as well. Um, and um, I think that's something that we should keep in mind. Um, I, I agree with the concern that we really don't have a lot of space and we need to um, look to planning for the future. Um, I just, th where are we going to put this program? I mean, I, th I think we're unfortunately just going to have to work around it up at the high school. I, th we need space for our maintenance program. We need space for the, our physical space right here for the Board of Education offices. We need more space for um, some of our students, um, you know, at the elementary school level. Um, we're working on the middle school level. I just, uh, to go out and seek space for the preschool, I just, I don't see that happening in the foreseeable future. Um, and it's not a huge um, expense in the grand scheme of our budget to um, make this the most comfortable and um, appropriate space for the children that are there now. So I, I am in support of this. I like the fact that we're combining the programs. I like the fact that we're expanding down to the threes. Um, I think this is an example of really coming in and getting a fresh set of eyes at something and, and enhancing it. And the other thing is we're going to be able, th this potentially will generate revenue that we can then put right back, reinvest right into the program and make it that much better. But, you know, as you know, when you grow something, you've got to first invest something in it to get it to where you need it to be before you can start to generate the revenue. And that's what we need to do here. Um, so I, I uh, fully support moving forward with this as it is proposed. I have a question on this. Um, that space, wh wh how big is that space? How many? Tom? Um, the ECC? Yeah. yeah. ECC is um, 12,573 square feet. Okay. So how many... Um, regular standard classrooms could you, you put in there if, if you wanted to do something like that for someone uh, who is... A general size classroom yeah. is running 750 to 900 square feet. Okay. And then is... Plus common, plus common area and yeah. so maybe core space. Two, two classrooms, three classrooms? No, you probably would get uh, maybe closer to seven. Seven? Okay. Seven in that area plus common space, bathrooms, janitor closet. It's a nice, it is a nice facility designed for early childhood. You know, this is not like a couple classrooms on the side of the building somewhere. That's you know, <laughs> right. And that's typical, unfortunately, in a lot of places. I mean, this is one of those things where I came here and I saw it. And I said, "This is a real gem. We are very fortunate to have this." And is is the ECC part? This is part of the high school program too. In other words, do high school students? They don't do anything. No, with that's that. a different. That's program. a different thing, right? Right. What am I thinking of? You're there? thinking of the uh, of the early childhood uh, curriculum okay. that we have. Sure. That's part of the family consumer sciences curriculum. That's a separate um, component at both of the high schools. Okay. That is nothing that you know. I'm trying to separate that completely. <clears throat> Remember, I said there's like three different early childhood that we have. So none of what I'm talking about here has any impact on That's fine. the programs at the high school where the kids go and are taking a, a course. Right. All right, so on this issue, any other questions? Uh, I, I saw Mr. Carey first and then Mr. Lowe. Go ahead. Uh, just as to expand on your question, um, Mr. Matola, I actually had a chance, Mr. Leonardo, to give me a tour of the ECC last spring when we were discussing this issue of the high schools. and um, it, it, it is designed for the kids. It's great. I mean, it's literally designed for <laughs> people this tall. <laughs> um, there is an area in there. They were very creative with the space. There's a, a kind of a pseudo-gym area in there that used to be a shop. 
uh, auto shop. So that area is kind of like high ceilings, wide open, and probably be harder to convert. Um, just to give you an idea of how the space fits in in comparison to two high schools, um, there's about a 5% difference in size of the high schools, which I think equates to about 22,000 square feet more at Ward, which roughly is 12,000 of that is the ECC. So we have a little more space at Ward than we have at Ludlow general space. Um, however, the amount of classrooms and special rooms line up almost equally. Um, but obviously, as we know, the, the load is going to be coming up the stream at Ludlow. Um, my question to Dr. Titles to make sure I'm correct on this, I'm looking at the, I, I, I always want to say non-recurring, it's the Town Capital Improvement Project is the new acronym. And the ex expenditure for bond there is 105000 for those two projects. And correct. Am I correct in assuming that, if I'm back to page three, um, the cost savings for this program um, by consolidating and charging tuition is $100,000. The $100,000 is the uh, savings in salary and benefits from con the program. It does so not include any tuition. That's an ongoing That's an ongoing savings. savings. Right. The tuition, we, it was too early to factor what that number would be, so we didn't include a number in, for tuition in the savings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I even hate to use this word in that it's a, it's a smaller number in the scheme of things because every dollar is precious at this point. And so I, I don't want to make a, a big deal out of this. What I, my, my point to about this issue is not necessarily about the now. It's about the future. Uh, in terms of the now, you know, I'm actually a preschool teacher. I teach part-time music. So I understand completely um, the importance of preschool education. And, and I think especially when it comes to safety, if it's something we actually need for safety, it's, it's definitely something we have to consider. What I'm trying to talk about is, as every penny is precious right now, do we spend something that we may not need in the future? And my question being is, I know from going to or being on sitting on the subcommittee for facilities that we have a, a potentially big problem coming up with space at the high schools. If we have space at another high school, possibly, that can be used for high schoolers, and it's going to save us, if, if we're looking at possibly seven classrooms, even if you go down to five classrooms, that could save us money in having to build more at one of these high schools, I think it's something worth looking at. And then I want to question, well, why are we investing right now in early childhood at that particular space when maybe we should be slowing down a little bit this year, as we are with many other ideas that have come up through the audit, et cetera, to understand where are we going, where are we going in the future? Because we will only be back here at the budget table in the next year looking at space at the high schools and going, my gosh, what are we going to do now? And so that's why I bring this up. I, I think it's something that we really need to understand and be careful about putting just even a dollar towards something that might not necessarily be something that shouldn't be living there for the future. Thanks. Um. Mrs. Iacono. Um, I just, you know, it, it's, it's, it's becoming beyond frustrating to sit here and be the Board of Facilities. I mean, we're talking about investing in the future of our community, and early childhood learning is so important. Um, I, I don't want, I, I just don't want to see us go backwards in that at all. Um, it's a program that we should stand behind, we should believe in, and that we should not want to diminish in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. Um, and I, it just upsets me to hear that we would want to go backwards on it. Um, I think we need to be investing in it. And I think we need to start talking about curriculum and um, enhancements and moving forward and education. And um, we'll find the space to make it work. It stinks. And it's hard, and we need to push for it, and it's frustrating. Believe me, I was at a building committee the other night. I wanted to pull my hair out. Um, but when it comes to curriculum, we just need to um, make it work. 
the best that we can and do what we can to, to make sure we don't lose any of that. Um, so I, I just hope the board really, really will remember that's why we're here. I just point out that there's sort of two separate issues here. One is the capital investment in the playground versus the operating budget impact of and the combining of the programs. And nothing in the audit, by the way, talked about doing any of this stuff about the preschool and the combining and the whole thing. They did talk about the tuition charging, um, but that's the, on, the only thing. The rest of this is really program enhancement and cost savings that you know, we identified. So I, this was not an audit thing, but um, there are two separate right. issues here, I guess, as I'm hearing the discussion. Um, Mr. Liu, do you have any other thing on anything else? Okay. Uh, Mrs. Brandt. Oh, 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 sure. Things, but we can talk about okay. Th Mrs. This Brandt. was relative to the same thing. Um, as I recall, capital isn't as time sensitive as some of the other, our, our, our uh, operating budget proposal. We still, again, as, as a board, haven't finalized our long range plan and we want to work that out with the town. And I absolutely am thrilled that the, we're expanding the early childhood. I don't think anyone that's a, a supporter of education feels any different. Where I want to hold up a little bit is until we have a sense of where we're going and, and have taken a look, um, if we have a safety issue, that's a top priority has to be addressed. Th that's, that's not even up for discussion. If, however, we're investing in a place, in a site, for the future, when we're not really sure what the future is, we can hold off on this. It doesn't mean we won't do it, but we can hold off on doing it now until we know what our long-range plan is, and then I think we may have a better sense if we want to proceed. The bids would probably go out in the spring um, through the chair to um, Dr. Title, and then the work being done in the summer, so we do have some time with this, and we might be able to figure out what we're going to be doing long-term. It's, and am I being hopeful? Yeah. Honestly, I am. But I also want to be very thoughtful when we're looking at doing a site and committing ourselves to something when we have other issues as well. So it's just I want to approach with caution. It doesn't mean we won't go there, but we, this isn't time sensitive. We have a little more time. Thank you, Mrs. Brand. Uh, anybody else on this subject? If not, we will... Any members have uh, more questions? You ready, Mr. Carey? Sure. Okay. I go to you. So I posed a few questions to administration after our last meeting, um, and I've got answers before me, and I, I must admit that I wasn't able to carefully listen to the conversation and understand this wonderful memorandum that I got from both the, uh, the high school headmaster. So I was hoping that uh, through the chair to Dr. Title, maybe you or some of his staff, and get a better understanding on um, my questions here on uh, class sizes under 15. And if you can just get a quick summary of this, it would be helpful. Right. We had um, put in the uh, budget book um, some summary of class sizes at the high school. And the request was, uh, all these classes that are under 15, you know, what are they? You know, kind of what are they and why are they the way uh, they are? So both of the high school headmasters compiled a list and um, it's at your places. Um, the basic, there's sort of two, I would say, major reasons why a course would have under 15 in it. One is because you're offering advanced or a culminating course in a sequence of courses, and we've generally offered that even if it was under 15. So you'll see some of those um, in there um, where you say have an AP physics class that has 13 students in it. Uh, AP chemistry, um, one of the sections um, is under 15 students, but there's 49 total students. Um, another uh, reason why courses go under 15 is the way the schedule is just put together and conflicts. Um, you may have a class of 15 and another class, the same course, that has 24 in it. And it's not that you want to have it that way. That's not ideal. 
you know, if you have 40 kids signing up for a class, you'd love it to be 20 and 20, but when you're putting master schedules together um, and kids are being slotted in and they have certain courses that they can get into and there's scheduling conflict, sometimes it just falls out that way, um, that you can only schedule in 14 kids, but somewhere else there's 28 of the same, you know, the same course. Um, and there are occasionally um, some low enrollment uh, courses in um, areas that are elective that we're trying to build. For example, um, if you're looking at the Ward one, you'll see the Chinese courses have relatively low enrollment. It's a relatively new program. Uh, if you want to build it and grow it, which we do, then you need to you know, offer the full sequence. And so you'll get courses uh, like that. Um, and you know, that's, that's mainly the reason for it. You know, when you average out the courses, which you saw in the other document, the average class size in the academic classes at the high school is around 20 to 21. So you know, on average, we're not low. It's just that you do get these attempts to schedule um, with the best efforts. You just can't you know, get them. So that's, that's what happens. Um, I think that's sort of the biggest, sort of big picture of it. If we want to pursue it in more detail, then I'm, I'm sure Mr. Coyne would love to come up and discuss the nuances of high school scheduling or Ms. Real. She's new to it, though, so, you know, we put him on the spot. But I don't know if that helps at least further the understanding of everybody about why sometimes there's really no way around it um, to offer our curriculum. I mean, there are times when if you don't have enough kids, we cancel it. I mean, there is a... You know. Well, that, that's yeah. kind of where I was going with this, right. and, and and I guess I understand we want to have a commitment if we start and they want to sequence and move forward, um, and I don't even want to try to wrap my head around the complexity of what it must take to build the schedule, um, but I remember that my college experience had a lot to do with brick stairs and lines, and one of the lines we stood in was for courses, and if you didn't get in in time, you didn't get to go. Um, is there, how, how often does that situation happen? I guess from an efficiency and practicality perspective, do, are we as efficient as we can be with this, especially as, you know, we just heard we're gonna have the space crunch coming up, or is, is and I know Mr. Matola, I've heard him ask this several times over the years, sitting out in the crowd, that maybe we need to have a more thorough review of the program and determine which programs aren't garnering enough interest or just don't draw enough kids through to be worthwhile. I mean, how, how do we make those decisions? Well, I think I'm going to have to defer on this one. Mr. Coyne, would you like to help us out here? I've, I was not part of the high school scheduling because I wasn't employed at the time, but I guess really the question is when do you, you know, just say there aren't enough kids, we don't offer the course, and you know, if you can talk this through a little bit, that would probably be helpful to everybody's understanding. I also say we have some courses while he's settling in and thinking about that. Uh, there is another type of course that we do try to keep intentionally low, and that's um, our workshop courses. Um, so you see a course here listed called Algebra 12 Workshop. Right. That's a course that we actually want to expand to five days a week next year. That's for kids taking Algebra 12. Um, so it's Algebra 1 for ninth graders, but it's for kids that are struggling and they need extra support. The workshop of that course we want to keep small because the kids need the additional assistance. That's another type of course we'd have a small number in. So you want to lend, lend any insight in here, Mr. Coyne? I'm going to need the question uh, either clarify or rephrase yeah. a little bit. I'm not sure what Tim sure. is asking. So, uh, I mean, Looking at this at the hundred, I'm I'm trying to look at this from the perspective of an RTM member. I have a former RTM member sitting next to me. I see that we've got a hundred classes with less than 15 kids in them. Is what the macro is on the page that I was looking at, which I I'm not even going to try to find at this point. Um, and I say, why do we have guidelines that say X this amount of kids, and we're booking all these classes smaller? We're not being efficient here. So how do I, as a board of ed member, answer that question to the RTM member, are we being efficient? How do we make that decision that, you know what, there's just not enough interest or it's not, um, 
worthwhile to run a class for eight kids? Well, or it is worthwhile because, and I'm looking for that because. Okay, well, there's several factors. Some, some of it I'm going to repeat what Dr. Title said. Some of them are at the culminating end of a course uh, sequence. And so we would never pull the rug out from under a kid who's studied uh, a language for three years and entering his senior year, and uh, now we're not going to offer the course because we didn't get 15 kids sign up for it. That's been a common practice for, well, as long as I've been here and in actually any school system I've been in, that's a commitment that we make to the kids and we have a sequential program. That happens in mathematics. It happens in world language. It happens in nearly every one of the core uh, the core areas. Um, if you look at the uh, the ward page, um, you can see, you know, just by looking at the groupings of the many sections of English. You know, English. Every student in the school takes English. Uh, the senior year has an elective program. Um, there are only. seven sections out of the 80 some odd sections of English that fall into that category. There are as many, I'm going to, with off the top of my head, probably as many that are over uh, 24. And so that's a, f that's a feature of the balancing of the schedule that Dr. Title was talking about. Um, if we run 13 sections of ninth grade English, which is what English 12 is, uh, Two of them fell under under the number. They happen to be two uh, classes that students with IEPs are in, and we intentionally keep those small. So, um, so it has to do with culminating classes. It has to do with balancing the schedule. That uh, the if a student is taking six classes, that those other five classes might actually dictate where that sixth class has to go for that student, and that you know, that will play a role in the number of students in that particular section. So it's going to be the balancing of the section, it's going to be the culminating class, and it's going to be graduation requirements. Uh, you described a situation when you were in college where, you know, if the course closed, the course closed, well, then maybe you had to take something else. That's not a choice for kids in high school. You know, I can't say, well, you know what, this year I'm not going to take English, or this year I'm not going to take the science because I got shut out of it. We have to make sure they can get it. And so sometimes we make those decisions, uh, whether it's whether the word is efficient or uh, fiscally efficient. Uh, that has to be for us has to be a secondary consideration. Can the students that w that need to meet a graduation requirement meet it by the program that we offer? And so sometimes it comes down to that. That you know that's a required course. That's a state required. We course, have to make right? sure that. It's the state well, that makes the requirement. Right. Or your own our, graduation right, requirements. Right, right. Or, it's or it's plus the state. Okay. Right. right. So, you know, sometimes it's, it falls into the category, too, of uh, we have to be able to offer this so that students can meet graduation requirements. Yeah. So those are the factors that go into those decisions. And, um, and, and I understand and support you know, having AP classes, and I understand the meaning of that, and, and I, I understand that we're going to have lower populations. A um, couple other questions related to this. I know there's been, that predated me probably by seven or eight years, a discussion of changing the high school schedule. Mm -hmm. And we have high school reform, and we have high school space. We have lots of, I've, now the operating budgets give us another high school discussion. We have a lot of high school discussions coming up, I sense. Would a different scheduling system potentially create more efficiencies, or is it the same problem irregardless? And I understand that that's a longer conversation that, than is going to happen in this budget session, but well, potentially could we be more efficient if we schedule differently? Let me take uh, a shot at it. You want to take a shot at it? Well, <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. In, in, some ways, in some ways, yes. Um, without going into a lot of detail, if the, uh, in a different schedule model where you didn't have to schedule separate science labs, it makes the scheduling a little cleaner that way. That's one, that's one factor. Um, but the schedule designs that, that we looked at and would support 
also open up more opportunities for kids to take more classes. Um, you know, we, and that, that was intentional, to open up opportunities. So while it might make the scheduling more efficient, if, you're, if you equate efficient with saving money, that's not what we're, you know, that's... The, the, model, that. the model that was on the table, uh, the 8-drop-2, for lack of a better right. term, the design there was to assure that everybody had lunch and didn't have to give up their lunch to take the eighth, eighth class. class. Right. No, there's, uh, what the percentage is, 20, 25 percent of the kids take eight classes now. They don't get lunch. They eat on the fly. They bring a lunch, whatever. Um, that does keep some kids and their parents from you know, having their kids take eight classes because they don't want to give that up. Uh, if you opened up a schedule with eight classes available and allowed the lunch, and say another 25% of the population decided they want to take the eight, now you've got a big staffing problem because you need more teachers right. to, to teach them. So that was actually one of the barriers to implementing that, that schedule. Um, but all things being equal, if you've got an eight period schedule and you go to another eight period schedule, that alone does not change the calculus oh, that you'll have, you'll have the same number of conflicts. Um, what creates conflicts in high school scheduling more than anything else, I mean, the lab is a great example, are singletons. Okay. The more singletons you have, the harder it is to schedule. Single section course. Single section of a course, you know, one section of something. Because it goes in one place, and if a kid wants that, and they have another singleton somewhere else, you know, pretty soon, there's not too many places conflicts. to move them. Okay. And so, um, and um, the more, um, levels that you have, academic levels that you have, you create more singletons. You create uh, more scheduling difficulties by deleveling, so to speak, at the high schools. It actually made it easier to schedule. As you're better off scheduling you know, 15 sections of English 22 and 15 sections of English 21 than trying to schedule a whole variety. It's just the more options there are to, to schedule it, the better. But eight in one form and eight in another form probably isn't going to make a big impact. And one other thing I want to point out on here is something like on the ward, this happens all the time in scheduling, economics, all right? 38 kids signed up for it, perfectly reasonable number. You're not putting them all in one class. I mean, we're not doing that. So you're going to have two classes out of it. In an ideal world, it's 19 and 19, it's 20 and 18, right? Just so happens that the way the schedule works out, one of those classes is under 15. But that's not a inefficiency or a, a cost to the district because you're going to run two sections of it. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. So just because it's under 15, you know, in that example, it's the same staff requirement. You know. That's why, we, that's why we decided, uh, why Vanessa and I decided to show you the student requests right. so that you could see those re the context, that the, the classes that fell below 15 how many student requests for each of those classes there were. So you can see the, the thinking behind deciding on two sections or three sections. I, I think it's important that we, we, as we move forward through the process, we, we try to put some type of addendum or explanation of that. As, again, looking at that at the 100,000 foot level, you can say, well, wait a minute. Yeah, it's a good point. You know, uh, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, one more tough question in this line. I, I, I you know, uh, and I don't want to pick on any one subject, but I see we have a lot of language, uh, four languages here. Um, at what point, when we're excited about a new program, or any program, where we don't have you know, 19, 20, 25 kids interested in it going into the stream. How do we evaluate and determine that, you know, well, we've got a program, but we're not seeing the interest year over year. Um, maybe we don't do that program anymore. Is there some type of vetting process for that that we? Well, in the time that I've been here, we have not looked at eliminating any of the languages. Um, we added Chinese incrementally starting three years ago. Last year was the first year that we had the four-year sequence. Um, you know, and that you know that was a, a program that was added. Um, 
you know, I, I don't think we'd be at the at the stage in uh, in the Chinese in the study of Chinese to to say, well, it, it had a four-year run and we wouldn't want to do it anymore. Um, any of the other languages are, you know, relatively healthy in enrollment. And uh, again, to get to offer a program that is um, a comprehensive high school program, you want to be able to offer offer those things. Um, the Latin program is, is an example of something that's grown. Um, and in, you know, in some school systems, Latin is, uh, they call it the dead language because nobody speaks it, but it's dead in other ways. And uh, the Latin program has actually grown because of student interest and enrollment. So it's, it's tricky. It's, it's a tricky thing to, uh, to do what you said, to, to vet it, to evaluate it. Um, I don't think we have a, I know we don't have a, uh, a format to do that in, nor have we agreed to a time frame. Uh, four years certainly isn't enough for something that's new, because we, we added a level each year. We started with Chinese 10, second year Chinese 20, the third year Chinese 30 as those kids move forward. <coughs> uh, is eight years enough to, to know whether or not the program mm -hmm. is sustainable? Ten years? Mm -hmm. and. The other ones, Italian, French, Spanish, you know, have, have been around and in the program for a long time. And they, you know, they each sustain, at our school at least, in the Italian and French, at least two full-time teachers. I'm not, I think it's uh, maybe a little bigger at, at Ludlow. Um, sure. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky thing, but it, in, in, we added Chinese in the, we just, within four years, so I know we're not at the stage of saying it's not there. And of course, our enrollment's growing. So there's going to be more right. demand for, for something. Right. They didn't, uh, on this subject, I, maybe I'm mischaracterizing this. Did the, the, the NEASC, it's NEASC, right, report, wasn't one of the things they wanted us to do is look at the for lack of a better term, audit the actual program to see, you know, what's working. And, and this isn't the audit that we've all been talking about for the last month or so, but the actual program itself, wasn't that one of their, I thought that was one of their recommendations to take a look at the actual program to see what is, the, uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I dreamt the, it. The, Chinese program? Or? No, no, a anything. The entire academic program that, that it's important to, to take we, a look we at. Got pretty, we got actually pretty high marks okay. on the comprehensiveness in our pro of our program, the, uh, the, ex the offerings within the program. Um, the recommendations relative to program were more about um, connecting our uh, academic expectations mm -hmm. with our curriculum merging the academic expectations of Fairfield Ludlow with those of Fairfield Ward, right. which we're actually working on this year. Okay. But not about, uh, not, not really a program evaluation in the way you describe right. it. We actually received accolades for the quality Accolades. of our offerings uh, and the, the comprehensiveness of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rosado, do you want to weigh in on any of this from the curriculum point of view? Yeah. I. I, I don't recall that kind of a recommendation right. in the ask, but we have been spending a lot of time this year working toward the, the recommendations that were in the report related to the programs at each of the schools and, and, and merging them in terms of the academic expectations. Also going to the, the, the comment about the Chinese program, um, when we start to see that the numbers are, are perhaps not what we would want them to be, to be, we would try, and we are this year, to put in some um, some, for lack of a better word, advertising, if you will, at the lower grades, perhaps at the middle school, to go and talk a little bit about the benefits of the program and get some kids interested so that there would be you know, greater enrollment as we go forward. I guess the, I, I, the way I look at it is, I know for years, and, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but I'm, I'm looking at it from the perspective of an RTM member, even a Board of Ed member, the public, that we add, we add, we add, and that's, that's good, but do we ever 
stop and take a look at the entire program and say, you know what, there, we, we added this class in 1978, and is it still relevant to what we do as educators, or is it just still there because it's been there since 1978, if you follow what I'm saying? Do we ever take a look at that type of thing? Yeah, and we do have a, um, a review cycle that we take a look at, you know, quite aggressively. It's a five to six year cycle for every single course. The curriculum leaders and the teachers are very involved um, through a process okay. uh, where we take a look at the current okay. curriculum documents. Do we want to continue with what we're doing? What revisions do we want to make? And those all then come before the board, as you know. And Jim, uh, if you look at uh, if you look at the program of studies. Mm -hmm. You know, you will see courses in there that you won't see, you know, on these charts or in your budget book because it didn't get the enrollment and we didn't run it. Okay. Right. Uh, you know, that's the only difference between uh, the programs at the two high schools is that sometimes a course will run at one school and not run at the other because there wasn't sufficient enrollment. Uh, when something doesn't run for enrollment purposes, for two or three years, that's when we start looking to say, probably Bounce shouldn't it. offer that anymore because, right. you know, there is no interest or, it, you know, it's not doing what it should. Right. Uh, one of the things that um, we did this year was to uh, simplify, or in the year to come, is to simplify the offerings in computer-assisted drafting, for example. There were a myriad of courses. They were often all taught in the same period. But a myriad of things that uh, drafting with animation, <coughs> drafting for engineering, drafting, a lot of various computer-assisted drafting. Um, we think it actually was confusing <coughs> to the kids to know what, where they should go, what they should take. So that was simplified. So yeah, that aspect of program review is, is an annual event. And not everything in the program of studies runs because of enrollment or for what we call FTE purposes. You know, if we have, you know, two FTEs in that particular area, then we run the equivalent of, you know, what two FTEs means in terms of course sections. So, um, on this subject, Mrs. Iacono. Um, I liked Mr. Carey's idea of some type of addendum that sort of explained how we how we came to be on all this um, I personally found it extremely helpful um, and I and if we could add in how um, it was done for Ludlow High School because they 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 went a step further and said nuances of high school scheduling extra support course culminating course in the sequence um, I think that would be good and I think this has opened up a really good discussion something that we should put on um, uh, a future agenda to talk about um, you know our courses and how they come to stay in existence how they come to fruition to begin with and how we eliminate them when they're not yeah. useful um, and I and I would like to also um, understand the metrics behind um, you know when do you decide you're not gonna when when something's not working when you've just started it for example, the Chinese program, you know, is it eight years, is it 10 years, is it 15 years? Mm -hmm. You know, if you can make some recommendations so that we're just not adding something and waiting for it to catch on. Mm -hmm. Not that we're doing that, but um, I think you understand where I'm going with that. Yeah. But um, I, um, I appreciate the insight into that because mm -hmm. obviously this is something that comes up quite frequently. And we really need to um, make sure we are operating the most efficiently way we can the efficiently way we can. Thank you. I think one of the ways to get at this on a systematic basis is as a curriculum comes up for review with you, you get high school course coming up for a whole department, this whole schedule. You know, when that particular department is up for a review, you know, that's a good time to discuss in detail that whole department because that means they've just finished the review Dr. Rosado talked about and they can explain, this is what we took out, this is what we put in, this is, you know, important to the sequence, we want to grow it, here's why. I mean, that could really have more of an in-depth discussion during that curriculum presentation on that one area. And it's going to come up every year, you know, it's a, there's a whole cycle to it. So that would be a good opportunity to, um, to get into that. Um, you know, we, 
you know, there's a tension between offering, you know, a comprehensive program and trying to um, give people the full breadth of the program, and you bump up against fiscal constraints. And you know, we've we've uh, tried to accommodate kids as best <coughs> we can, and um, sometimes that does, particularly in the culminating sequences, end up with classes of seven and uh, eight. And we've done a tremendous job, and the data is compelling on the large increase of kids we've gotten in AP programs over the past seven or eight years. Uh, that comes out in the fall. Um, not only have we increased the number of kids in AP programs here dramatically, but the scores of the kids in those AP programs has actually gone up on average. Um, so some of these AP courses are in here, and they do grow over time. We've had some real you know, <coughs> successes in terms of AP. Um, so I just want to point that out. It does, it does grow occasionally. Uh, Mrs. Brand. I think it even extends to the textbooks. We had a discussion in subcommittee, and again, the textbook wasn't looked at just in isolation. It was looked at in context and also taking into account what we're looking at for future high school graduation requirements and how this course would be helpful. So even when we're looking at textbooks, that is always incorporated, and it's always forward thinking. Um, I think Mr. Carey had the floor. Are we so done with the, this topic? We're done with this topic? Yeah, I am. Now. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you. Point. I want to point out that Miss Real is here, but I let her off the hook because she's new and wasn't, hasn't scheduled the school yet. So let Mr. Coyne carry the water on that one. We'll get her, um, ne we'll get her next. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Coyne. That was, that was Jack Boyle's one. Uh, <laughs> I, I had asked a couple of questions. I don't see the answers here, so I'm wondering if they haven't come back from our uh, actuary yet, our consultant, rather. That's um, correct. They have not. So you don't, okay. We sent them off to them as soon as you sent them, and we've not received responses. So we're hopeful Tuesday okay. at the latest. I mean, the, if, we, if we get them earlier, we'll email them out. Is my IBNR question something that the administration can answer, or is, is that something we set, or do we get that from them as well? well? We do that in consultation with them. I don't know if, Bonnie, if you want to talk about that IBNR setting of the IBNR number. Basically, my, my question was that medical expenses are going to increase 10%. And I think six and nine, and the right. from, uh, the dental and the, the why prescription. Isn't why isn't the IBR IBNR going up to match those increases? Uh, historically, we have not done a projection on IBNR. We're using our actual last calculated IBNR, which was for six thirty ten. Uh, yes, they will be going up, but it will be a, an effect of the actual claims uh, paid, and. There would be a, some sort of a calculation that would adjust for that. We don't show it in this projection at this time. Okay. And Aon does not calculate it at this time. And if you can refresh my memory, um, the chair to like the title or Mrs. McQueen, um, the IBNR is based on how many months' experience? It's roughly a six, it depends upon the line of business because some claims um, based on the type of insurance coverage are paid more quickly than others. <laughs> so our medical line is about four to five weeks. Our RX line is uh, about two and a half weeks, and our dental line is about the same. Okay. Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield projects our IBNR for their medical claims. We, get, we take that number from them. Aon does not calculate that. Um, Aon does do the RX and dental. So if that number potentially goes up, does that change this? If it, Sh if does it change number, it for you? <laughs> if the number goes up, then yes, that would change the calculation um, only for the end of year balance remaining. But yes, it would. Uh, I'll reserve the rest of my questions on medical reserve until we'll see if we get those other answers. Um, I can defer at this point, Ms. Mattel, if you want some other people to take the lead. I've got a few more things, but it's up to the board. Mrs. Iacono. Um, I was the board member who asked about the staffing and the support staffing um, with the questions that are sitting at the table. Um, and um, my question has to do with um, support staff, non-certified staff, um, each year we face scrutiny for the number, for the head count that we have in this area. Um, can you explain to me why it's necessary for each particular 
headmaster or department head per se to have their own secretary um, or clerical staff. I know in the business world, these positions are often shared. Why does that not work in the um, education world? World. Well, department heads, they don't, they don't have secretaries. Are you talking about like house masters? Yeah. Yeah, house masters. Um, I know the design of the house system is, you know, set up for that, but um, why couldn't a uh, house master share a secretary with another house master or with another part of the department? I don't have an answer for that. Does anybody want to weigh in on that one? The only thing I would say is that in, in, at the high school, the houses are set up almost as schools within schools. Mm -hmm. So such as you go to an elementary school, there's a secretary there to receive calls, to schedule appointments, to problem solve things with parents who may come in or students who may come in. So it's not unlike a school within a school. So you could compare the way the structure is that there are three houses in each of the high schools. Each one of them is its own separate school. I mean, that's, that's the concept. Um, to share uh, a clerical person or um, between the two houses may be um, physically difficult. Um, just just because of the locations, mm -hmm. you, obviously you could um, combine the houses, and you could have one to, you know, you know, assist with a larger house. I mean, if that's what one chose to do, but that that's the concept. So they're physically not located near one another. They're physically not located in one another. As a matter of fact, when the schools were originally renovated back in, I'm just trying to think, was it about two thousand? 2000, well, when they started, the, about 2000, we started this project. Um, they were very specifically um, planned so that they would contain three separate houses. And it goes back to, um, yeah, prior to consolidation of the high schools, um, where the, the old Roger Ludlow Middle School, Roger Ludlow High School, rather, and the old Andrew Ward High Schools each had houses. I think they had three houses at the time, so they, they, that was the model. And when we um, consolidated to Fairfield High School um, during the time of the declining enrollment, it too had three houses. So the decision was made by a former board when we decided to um, go into the, the two high school model. We considered several other alternatives. One was a large high school, one was a freshman campus. And then the community and the board decided that we wanted to go to the two high schools and the, the idea was to have the three houses within the two high schools. Right. And that's how it's set up. And, and then the same would be for um, deans and guidance counselors that in terms is, of their loads. It's because mean of that the house system and the physical um, location. I would say that's true of the deans mm -hmm. because there, at present there's one dean assigned to each House, I, I see Mr. Coyne coming in the the mirror there. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm getting. I'm, I think I'm going to get the hook. <laughs> I think I may be talking too much. Mm -hmm. um, the the deans would be assigned to a house, so that would be a similar kind of thing. The counselors, there are basically three counselors assigned to a house, you know, and that's the way it was set up, and that's the way it continues to be set up. And now I'll defer to Mr. Coyne, who really can clarify it a lot better than I can. So. Okay. Come on up to a microphone, uh, I think. Mr. Klein. I can project. Right. I'm sure you can. <laughs> Should have left you up here. Yeah, but no, to just to uh, give a little uh, more complete picture, while the house, you know, the, the way it was described here, the secretary reports to the house master, but the secretary serves the house. And so there's... Uh, you know, there's roughly 450 kids, 450 families, uh, 40 to 50 teachers assigned to that house. So it's not working for the house master. It's really working for the house. So and really the question I should have asked is what is the workload of somebody who's supporting that? 
particular house. Well, so and very simply, like you know, to handle, like Jack made a great example, you know, uh, thinking of the elementary school right. uh, secretary. Um, the, uh, the, the student attendance for the house, the uh, discipline referrals, that the kids that come in t into the office, the families that come in for uh, family meetings, uh, all of that stuff is the role of the of the house secretary. So it's not like she's just uh, serving, you know, the house master. It's really serving the the needs of the teachers in the house, the families in the house, and the students in the house. So it's it's a significant uh, responsibility in terms of a workload that way. It's also really that the guidance secretary is a whole different function. That is really busy work at a high school. That's you're talking about transcripts, college applications, setting things up with uh, all kinds of paperwork. I mean, that, that's a whole different, yep. you know, animal. And again, it's for about the you know 450 uh, kids. Um, I've never seen a guidance secretary not just frazzled at all times. It's just an, and everybody needs something you know yesterday. Um, and, and so it's really important to kids, and, you know, particularly through the college process, to have good service from the guidance secretary because that's the keeper of a lot of the, uh, the goodies that need to get through the system and out. Um, but that's really a different, completely different job from the traditional, uh, I guess, traditional secretary, for lack of a better way to describe it. Um, you know, like anything else, um, the house system just in general, and you, you look at the guidance council laws and so on and so forth, I mean, we provide, um, you know, I would say an above average level of service to our families, um, not just at the high schools, I mean, throughout the district, in lots of different places. So, I mean, sure, could you save money by jacking up the ratio of kids to a guidance counselor? Sure. I mean, but you'd be reducing service. Um, and that's, you know, that trade-off we could make in hundreds of places in this in this district, um, and the other thing is that you know as the enrollment grows at the high schools, I mean we know what's happening. Um, we're not going to need to add guidance counselors, you know, to accommodate that. You know, we're we're, we're set. So um, because the ratio will still be you know will be good. Um, so knowing that the enrollment is growing, that might be a short-sighted you know decision to make, but. Um, we do provide in this community, a, you know, a service level um, in lots of ways that's nice and it's an attraction. It's something people value and it's something people look for. And um, so I, I think that's, uh, you know, it's a service level question. Great. Yeah. No, thank you. That was very helpful. Yep. Mrs. Albin. I'd just like to thank Mrs. Iacono for asking the question because it's easy to look at numbers on a page and wonder how, why so many people. Um, but as Mr. Boyle and uh, Mr. Coyne noted, um, I, can, I can tell you as a, someone who interacted with these people, uh, as a, a parent for students who were, you know, the users, um, I consider the secretary um, in the house they're sort of a jack of all trades because they're doing a number of jobs, um, as was noted. And the secretary in the counseling offices, as Dr. Title noted, um, is very busy pretty much every day of the year that they're in that office. Um, and many of those people work beyond their normal work day just, just to get it all done. Um, so, uh, and, and also, I'm glad that we have the right number of guidance counselors, and hopefully it will be the right number of guidance counselors, but um, if anyone wanted to engage me in that discussion about strengthening a department in our high schools, that would be one of the things that we really n probably need to spend a lot of time and focus on and strengthen for all our students, um, regardless of where they're headed after high school. So anyway, thank you for the question because it gave the opportunity to highlight the work that these people do and how valuable they are. Anybody else right now? I have a couple questions as this gets spilled. 
Mr. Fadiby. I, I guess I have a couple of questions since we're talking about staffing, and it relates to staffing, so I figured I'd raise it now. And this is on page 139 of the uh, budget. Um, indicated in this is a, uh, at the bottom right corner you highlighted before, uh, the number of, I guess I'd call, net um, staff people was in the bottom right-hand corner is 6.2 is the net increase of staffing for this budget year. Um, and you got that, is my understanding, from taking uh, the staffing f from the grants and moving, in essence, and up to the operating budget staffing level because the grants are no longer available. Is that right? In other words, how you net it out? We're, right. We're showing, uh, well, what we're showing here is the number of, the net number of new positions being requested. Okay. Um, however, we have to budget for more than 6.2 because some of our existing personnel, to maintain them, the grant has run out and we need to put them into the operating budget. So the 6.2 represents actual employees, regardless of funding source. That's how that number is arrived at. You can see up top that some people that, that, that a number, the number of FTEs attributable to grants is declining. Right. So, so that's correct. So if those grants were available today, right, the operating budget would not increase by 19.3. That's correct. People. Right. right. If the if those, if say all those grants stayed, right, that 6.20 would not change. Right, but, but you would have a different. Your difference would be up top here. Right, it's a question of where the funding is. Exactly, where the funds come. And that's from. always been uh, right. that's confusing, you know, because you say, well, how many new, you know, how many new people are you hiring, you know, above and beyond your current staff is different from how many staff you have to add into your budget. Right. Yeah, that's what we're trying to show. So my understanding of the primary source for the grant fundings in the past that is being, in essence, replaced now by our operating budget. That's right. Is the um, funding from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. That's the biggest chunk that of it. You, you find on page, um, page six, I think, which indicates uh, down where the federal funding is, is my guess, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, mm -hmm. IDEA Part B money of $2.2 million no longer exists. That's not the staffing piece. That's not the staffing piece. No. There is no staff in IDEA or Part B. The staffing is found in the SFSF funding of the ARA grant. So if you look on page... Right. Well, that, that's the American Recovery uh, and Reinvestment Act funding that flows through the state, but it still comes from federal dollars. Is that right? Right. Well, it's just correct. administered by the state. Right. That's correct. So, if you don't mind me, it, it, you, uh, and, and Mr. McQueen, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's page six in the center under state, era stabilization, ed grants slash governor services grant. 512.168, which ties to page 9 in the bottom under era state fiscal stabilization where we have a loss of 9.45. That's correct. That's it. Which that money will go back into our ECS grant, hopefully. That's the hope. If the governor comes through and the legislature comes through. All right, but this, this funding from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that is now administered by the state and provided by the state, that funding was, was that always intended to be a two-year funding cycle? Right. Correct. Correct. So, so my question arises as to, since that funding was a two-year cycle, and I guess in that funding was intended to supplement 
existing funds but not supplant the existing funds. Is well, that accurate? Uh, not with the state fiscal stabilization fund. That was a pure supplant by the state. So, all, right. all they did was take the money out of the ECS and use the RSFSF fund to fund 14% of it. They did this in every school district in the state. So it was a pure supplant. So we ended up with it. The only reason we ended up with it was that the federal government demanded that this portion of money go directly to school districts because they were afraid that states were going to gobble it up and supplant it. And Connecticut pulled a fast one and managed to do it anyways. So this was a pure supplanting. This is different from you know, your typical IDEA money, which there's a prohibition against doing what you described. This was purely a matter of moving money that normally had gone to the town and was sent to us and was designed to do exactly what happened. And this is happening just about every district in the state. Um, so that's, you know, 99 percent of the time, you're exactly right. We get grants. There's a prohibition. You can't supplant. You have to supplement. This is the one thing where it's not how it worked. Right. So in this instance, one could not say that those uh, positions that were funded from that grant were, in essence, supplemental positions. That's correct. In which then you can reduce those positions possibly and have the same level of service you had right. two years ago. That's no, that's not, right. That's it's not the case. That's so, right. All right. And it's, it's, just it's primarily and due by the way the state, uh, this, uh, I would say, inappropriately yep. reduced the but state uh, correct. grants by the amount of the federal funds. The point funded. of those funds, way back, was to help school districts from having to make devastating cuts in their programs because of the fiscal emergency that, that the, everybody was, was under. Um, in some states, states actually took that money and said, here you go, on top of your state money, this is the money from the government because the design was to save jobs. Right? Connecticut decided not to do that. And so the state now is in a hole because they have a $271 million problem um, and because they supplanted. So they've got a big funding cliff. And um, so it was, a, it was a pure supplant. It was, it was completely contrary to the intent of the legislation. And the, gover and the state of Connecticut was under an investigation by the inspector general. Um, and was rumored at one point to be disqualified from even participating in Race to the Top because they had so flaunted the federal government's intent with this money. Um, it's a big scandal. It's like getting investigated by the Inspector General is not a good thing. You know? That's like saying the IRS has a surprise for you. Okay? Uh, <laughs> it's not pretty. And they went up and down the side, and, then, and finally they said, well, you know, technically they could do it, blah, 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 and, and, but, but that's, so that's what happened. This is, a, this is just a replacement. It's, you know, and that's, that's one of our issues with this budget, you know. Now, theoretically, if the state fully funds ECS, at least keeps it level, then this money will, this $512,168 will revert to what it used to, which is goes into the general fund of the town. You know, that, that's, that's what's supposed to happen, but that's a prediction about what the legislature might do. So, right. yeah, it's the not... The line, it seems, yeah, the state put us in a more difficult position than we would have had been in, but for the state's withdrawing of those funding. You got funding. it. Funding. Couldn't have said it better myself. Mrs. Albin? <laughs> On that point, I just came from a meeting where the discussion, part of our discussion was that CABE, the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education, has joined with CAPS, and perhaps Dr. Title will remember the other one. Is it SBE? What, what are their initials? They've, they've, um, CABE and CAPS. And the third is escaping me. It's in my notes that are in the car. Um, have joined together to work to see if this 14% funding will be restored in the budgets. Um, they've all committed funds of their own so that they can um, lobby and work on this issue to try to get this money back to the districts. 
But even if that happens, that money's going to the town. Right. 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 So we have to accommodate it in our budget, regardless of what the legislature does. Mr. Carey. Just to this issue, I, I remember only because of the hour of the evening two years ago, this discussion at the RTM around 1 a.m. when they removed the $500,000 from our budget mm -hmm. because it was coming to us directly. Right. And then I remember the board at that time having to assign the money to something. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I also know last year our conversation was very careful to understand that we did have to assign this money to something, but it was portioned out as it is now as a separate revenue funding source that subtracted out. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is something that we knew was coming. Um, and uh, all things being equal, if the state refunds ECS as to the levels it was at, the town will be whole. And you need a crystal ball for that one, so. And hence the difference in the percentage increase in the operating budget that I referenced in the beginning. It's a little quirky. Now, the state gave school districts and towns the option of reducing the budget by that amount of money. Um, not every town did that um, because they knew this was coming and it was going to be incredibly difficult to explain. Uh, but here we are. You could have predicted it two years ago that this day was coming. Um, so we're, um, and um, the guidance on how to allocate this money, what I recall from two years ago was that this was specifically to save jobs. That was the intent of the legislation. So this was not the kind of money they were going to allow you to simply assign to some soft costs or some non-recurring expenses. They wanted to see this assigned to jobs because one of the points of this was, and you might remember there's a whole data collection around this, how many jobs were saved by the ARA money, right? And we all had to submit, duly submit, you know, and the only way to do that is to assign this money to an FTE account and, and then report it. So it isn't like at the time, I remember doing this in, the, in my last district, we could say, well, we know there's a funding cliff coming, so we're going to go assign this to some non-recurring expense so we don't get stuck. You were required to put this against staff and, and, and benefits. Um, so it's one of those where maybe you wouldn't do that ordinarily because you create the funding cliff, but you really were tied by this one. Congress wanted to show politically that this saved X number of jobs. And it did for two years. And two years were up. Okay. Um, anybody else? All set. Mrs. Brand. I, I spoke with Dr. Title earlier because I, again, am still, I wanted to give him the heads up that I am still uncomfortable with the stop gap loss and and I, I think um, Dr. Title has um, through Mrs. McWayne some different numbers to give us but it, I, I still wanted to just because I realize that's going to leave us with a terrible hole um, but again I am concerned about this if we take on this risk and something does happen we have enough in the account I think to carry us over for one year, it's that subsequent year that I have a concern about if we, we maintain this, that we could find ourselves in an, uh, unfortunate circumstances of not having funds. And, and with, w before you start ex answering that question or concern or addressing it, just explain the whole stop gap stop situation. Loss. Stop loss, excuse me. Right. Um, so in a self-insured uh, world, you're basically um, – accounting for claims that you, you know, you, you endure. Um, but there's always the possibility of a catastrophic claim throwing the whole thing out of kilter in any given year. Um, somebody has a million dollar, two million dollar horrible thing happen, an individual claim. So to protect against that, the companies have found a way to make money. And the way they make the money is they, you can buy an insurance policy against that. Um, and so you pay a premium. Um, depending on what the, the limit is. And so you purchase a limit. Um, any individual claim that goes above the limit does not go against your claims and has to be absorbed by the insurance company that sold you the insurance. It's like insurance on your car with a dedu deductible. Right? Um, and so uh, when, when I was looking at the renewal and looking at the impact that was going to have on the operating budget and what really 
key, <laughs> we're getting to the point where, you know, important core functions were going to need to be compromised to make this work. Um, I, I saw that we had what I considered to be, and what AI confirmed was be a relatively low stop loss figure of $150,000 which means that any claim, individual claim, this is not collective claim, any individual, you can also buy aggregate stop loss, that's a whole other thing. This is individual stop loss. Any claim over $150,000, our fund isn't on the hook for. Uh, the premium, in round numbers, the premium for that was about $950,000. Um, and so we asked Aon to price out with Blue Cross some different pricing points. You know, if we increase that to 300,000 to 500,000, what's the break point here? Um, and um, turned out that in where I um, actually had understated the savings, um, the savings, the, the premium goes to approximately $400,000 by taking the cap up to, to 300. So about a 550,000. The reason I had thought of 450 is because when we netted this out of the budget, we also had to add back in the expenses attributable to the changes in the Health Care Act, the Obamacare Act, required that even our plans can't charge copays for well care visits. And so they've um, projected actuarially what that will mean in additional expenses to the school district. And that was in the 100,000. That's where I was goofed up on the numbers. So the actual savings from the stop loss, and we're going to get a sheet with precise numbers on this because one of the questions that Mr. Carey asked that we haven't finalized was, you know, what, what's the sum total of all the savings that we've sort of got into, baked into this budget? And that's one of the numbers, but we want to get the exact figure, so we're going to get that to everybody by Tuesday. Um, so that's basically it, and um, my discussions with the Aon reps was they're very comfortable with that figure. Um, th uh, we have 1,422 people on the plan. Uh, our experience with this has been very good. Um, and so um, it looked to be a prudent risk. Um, so it's a balancing act. Risk tolerance. Um, so if we don't like this, then we either add $550,000 to the budget, that line, or we cut $550,000 or some middle ground on that. And so my judgment on it, my recommendation is to go to the 300000 even though um, I realize there is some, some risk in there. But a catastrophic claim still isn't going to kill us because it's a $300,000 cap there. It isn't like we're, as, as I think Steve mentioned the other day, naked with this. Um, some places do that. Um, so that's, I don't know if that's no, that was good. I mean, too much of an explanation. No, that was <laughs> good. You get to know the arcane ins and outs of these things in this job because there's big money at stake and it, this is going to impact instruction if we don't get it right. So that's why I dive into these details maybe more than people would want. But this is what your superintendent spends time thinking about sometimes, because it, if, it do, if it doesn't go here, it's going somewhere else. Mr. Fadiby. <laughs> Just a thought. Does the, the town is self-insured as a whole. Does the town have a stop loss, and do you know what their stop loss is? They do have a stop loss. Is it the same? 150? It's 150. They, um, <laughs> when they heard that I was floating this idea, they got very excited that they might do the same thing, because they saw this possibility and hadn't thought of it and we're going to try to copy us. Then they found out that they've had some major claims that are ongoing that would cause them major issues and so they basically can't do it. But they have a 150 um, and um, they really can't make that change at this point. I mean, maybe in the future the town could, but at this point the Aon was not recommending that, but that's their call. Do you know if, um, God forbid, you have an employee who is over three hundred thousand um, dollars. Is it is it three hundred thousand dollars per year for the particular employee, or if the employee hits the three hundred thousand dollar threshold, um, is he um, does the insurance kick in and cover all expenses thereafter for if it's two or three years? Do, or does go to? That? I don't know if it goes back to. Do you know, Bonnie? If it goes back to three hundred every year, is that an annual it goes thing? Back, it's an annual thing. On so we're on annual. the hook every year for. That's correct. Three hundred thousand. Even if it's the same mm -hmm. occurrence with a particular employee, but it, yes, and she, that's part of the reason why the town can't afford to change theirs is because they know they have some really big claims out there that are going to be ongoing, that um, they're not 
going to take that chance on because it is renewable every year. You start at zero on July 1st. Now, this is an annual decision. Right. Right. Um, so uh, a year from now, health insurance looks different. If people feel like this is too much of a risk, whatever, I mean, we can always change it either way. It's an annual decision. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where, you know, get away the pros and cons and just make your best judgment. We've had years, Bonnie, where we've done well in that area with respect to Multiple claims. years. Multiple years. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. And that was what we asked them but to I'm, research that. What right. I'm getting is the historical, they, they had already done it, but I don't have the numbers, so we are getting all those totals for you, number of claims and dollar value. Yeah. It's nice we have healthy teachers. That's great. <laughs> all employees. Not just all of our employees, that's right. 1,422 lives, as they say in the business. That's the term. It's not 1,422 people are on our insurance. It's 1,422 lives. That's right. This Got to get the lingo. It's such a good place to work. Your stress level's a little down, and you don't have claims. So it's because of the great working conditions. Board members covered. Mr. Yeah. Right. yeah. Can I get? Yeah. Can we get a piece of the action? Right. Okay. Mr. Carey. <laughs> so uh, to this. Wow. Oh. Speak to the motion, or? Okay. So uh, to this. Point, um, and I think Mr. McQueen has indicated this, but I, I did ask to have the last couple of years' experience in terms of what our stop loss was. Right. So if that's one of the things, we'll okay, because um, I do want to make sure that we're consistent. Um, my concern doesn't lie with this piece as much as um, how we're funding this overall, but speaking to this piece is to give the members some numbers to, for food for thought. It looks to me from what and gave us that we spent $965,390 last year for the privilege of um, getting $172,836 worth of stop loss coverage. Correct. So we paid a premium of $792,554 to get that $172. Um, so I think this is a question that, and it's an important question because we do have to look at where we're going to have risk because there is risk, obviously, when you're self-insured. Um, the question is, do we want to pay for um, insurance or do we want to pay for the actual experience? And that's uh, something that we have to ponder. I, I think that um, at this point, with budgets as they are, I'd rather pay for the experience um, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that as quickly as we can run a million and a half, two million dollar surplus, um, things can go bad and go the other way. And we could be two million dollars underwater. Um, so I think this was a good first step in our meeting earlier this month that we got to hear from the consultants and get a little better understanding of how this works as a board. Um, what I'd like to consider if we're going to continue on this path in terms of funding it this way uh, to 100 percent of IBNR and without surplus is that we get some type of um, regular periodic report so we know what kind of glide path we're on here. Mm -hmm. um, again, we're going to have uh, an obligation if this starts to go south to report to the boards so they can reserve against the risk. Mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're, as I mentioned, when we had this discussion, we're in an ecosystem with the town side here. Um, you know, looking at this historically and what they gave us, our consultants are very conservative. Mm -hmm. And we seem to come up ahead all the time. And I certainly don't want to second guess that and say that we should fund below 100%, because I think that we need to be <coughs> responsible in that area. So I, I do think this is a fair compromise in terms of um, a way to find savings in here. We do inherit a little more risk. But it doesn't look like, unless I see something different from Mrs. McQueen in terms of our experience over the last few years, that um, we're getting good value for that $900,000. So if we can reduce that by a half million dollars, um, understanding and as a board, I think it's our responsibility to, to stay on top of this and work with the administration to verify that we're working in the right direction. Um, because if this goes in the right, wrong direction, they're going to have to start moving big buckets of money around, and they're going to come to us and say, oh, we've got to transfer money from this instructional program to medical reserve. Um, so I, I think it's incumbent on us to, to be involved in terms of our governance role with this. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Carey. Um, anybody else? I have a couple of questions. Um, I, uh, I see that, if I'm reading this correctly, that, that each, it's that each elementary school has a, an inform, information tech support staff person. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. What do they do exactly? I, I kind of think I know what they do, but can you come up and explain that to me? We're going to need... Nancy can Nancy. Want to take it. Hi. Hey, Nancy. Um, the elementary media technician's um, primary function is to support the uh, computer infrastructure in the buildings. They um, do everything from fix a computer that's not working, remove paper jams, um, work on software implementation, software installation, keep software up to date. Um, and then another piece of their, their job is actually assisting students in the computer labs, um, assisting the library media specialists. They do some professional development. They support the Edline website and teachers who are maintaining their own pages, help them with uh, posting pictures, for example, or new videos and that sort of thing. Um, and they also do other kinds of jobs in the building, such as um, bus duty, recess supervision, lunch supervision, and those sorts of things. So they're really um, primarily a computer support function, but they do a lot of other things as well in the building, as most elementary staff does. Okay, so they're, all right. Tech support. They're tech support, yeah. but they they're do other things. tech support, but they do other things, exactly. Really? Are, they, are they members of a union? Yes, they are. They are, mm -hmm. okay. All the buildings, techs are part of a bargaining unit. What's the turnover rate for those people? Um, very small. Really? Yeah, in the 12 years I've been here, uh, I think we've gone through maybe six people, and it's funny how it always seems to be the same building. Um, Typically, we have um, somebody that comes in for a couple of years, and a lot of times it's either people that are, have gone back to get a postgraduate degree and have decided to get into education, and they kind of come through the back door here, become library media specialists, so it's their exposure to that, that area. Or sometimes they're kids right out of college that are, you know, first-time business uh, experience. Um, so they turn over. But I have a lot of folks that have been here for 12, 15 years. Right. So are they... Are they, excuse me, are they certified in anything? Like Some of them are certified in uh, A-plus and network certified, and others are not. All right. All right. You're more likely to find the more heavily certified folks in the department here. The, the department here and at the secondary people. level, that's right. true. Um, right. That's where they're we do here. have some elementary folks that have gone out and gotten their A-plus certification, which is the, the hardware repair um, certification. And so, we encourage them to do that. So they, it sounds like they do more than just um, service the technology needs of, at a particular school. They do that and they do other things. That's very true, described. especially at the elementary level. Okay. Mm -hmm. How long have we had full-time tech support at each elementary school? Do For as know? long as I've been here and then some. Really? Yeah. Okay. It precedes me. How long have you been here now? Twelve years. Okay. Thank you. Margaret Mary, do you know? I, I'd, I'd have to go back and check. I, it's 15 I it's years, a, maybe? I yeah. think it's 15, but that's a guess. Right. All right. Mrs. Brand, you have something on that? Yeah, it wasn't actually about this. Is it all right to, are we ready? Sure, to, thank okay. you. Do you, have, do you have another computer tech question? No. Okay. No. Oh, well, you, you can too? stay there, Nancy, for a oh, little bit. Okay. Sorry. Do you want to do that first and then? Oh, no, not all. Go ahead. As long as Mrs. Brand is up. Um, you gave us a really great, summary last year of like the last three or four years of what your budget was and what you actually ended up with. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to get something like that again? Certainly, I have it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember in the back you of my... You have it in gory detail. Yeah, I remember in the back <laughs> of my head, and, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to hit a source, but then a second question, let me, let me finish this one. Remember in the back, I think it was 2007, 2008, we had about a $1.5 million line for technology, or was, is that... Are we talking capital? Capital, yeah. Yeah, close to that. Maybe, okay. maybe not quite as, that high. And now we're down to around 900, if I'm reading this correctly? Yeah, um, year, okay. last year we were at 600, yeah. Right, so we went from 1.5 million, about We've three or 400 students to go, down to 600, mm -hmm. and we brought it back up a little bit, and we're still... 
trying to? There was one year we were at 300 and something. That was a few years ago. Okay. If you could show what your requests have been and where we are, is obviously technology is one of the things that was in the operational audit. You want That's it for the highlight. entire operating budget, Mr. Carey, or just for the capital? Just for the capital, okay. uh, I think, is, sure. is, is How many years would you like? Mm -hmm. um, four. Okay. Um, and I, and I want to hit a sore spot, but I, I see that we're still trying to replace computers. They are circa what year? Uh, well, most of them are about eight years old. We're running between six and eight years. We have some apples that we're replacing that are on the six-year mark um, used in the art department at the high school. Um, okay. The majority of the PCs that are across the district are about eight years old. And based on your original technology plan that I've looked at for the last couple of years, how many hundreds of computers are we behind in your five-year refresh plan? Uh, about 325. And that's beyond this, or that's the ones we're putting in here now? No, that's beyond that. So we still be 325 computers in the six to eight year old range on top of the 464 we're trying to replace. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Mrs. Brand. I, there was one other thing I wanted to ask. I noticed that um, you had increased staffing for McKinley, again, appropriate. In fact, I, I saw a shift, in a, and I liked the approach because it was very consistent. What I did want to ask is I also noticed that um, Tomlinson had a decrease, and in terms of numbers, that made good sense to me. But the only concern I had was that we also have um, the McKinley community that has potentially ELL concerns, and they're not going to have their instructional improvement teacher. So what I'm wondering is, is, is there some backup in the event that they do have a need, because this is a community that can potentially have greater need? The ELL... Um staffing in the district is currently being reviewed, uh, not in terms of adding additional staff to it, but um, we have our team over here, Cattail Leonard and uh, Margaret Murray Fitzgerald, looking at that, and we are not recommending in this year's budget, because we're being prudent, an increase in ELL staffing, but we are looking at uh, realigning it even this year to align with the needs of the kids, because I think we've put them in places where we thought the kids would be, and then the kids move or others come in, and we just need to be flexible about moving them around. So the answer is um, we are looking at the deployment of the ELL staff. Um, we also have, it's a very small stipend, but you might have noticed uh, an additional stipend for um, somebody, I think it's like a $1,300 1347, 48, one of those stipends for somebody to really coordinate the ELL. We don't have anybody in the district that really coordinates it. So um, we're hoping one of the existing ELL people will step up and take a leadership role there. So we are planning to redeploy the ELL staff based on where the kids actually land uh, instead of just putting them where they, we think they might land. So that's, that's part of it. I don't, do you want to comment on that or did I capture it? That was it. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that raises one more thing and that when we're talking tonight, there are a lot of things that we, I, I think this is very lean, but my, qu my, my point is, is that what we're, where Mr. Carey is going and I think would be helpful if we could have just a cursory list of things that we would like to have, you wanted to put in and chose not to. I think when we're moving forward to have people appreciate Capital is pretty easy. You can see it with your long-term plan, but programs, educational needs, what we're not doing, I think also is important for people to appreciate, And because they don't see that unless we, are, we, we say it. Yeah. I think it's well, worth I, it. Well, I think that's, we, we were just talking about that before the meeting, um, because when Mr. Kerry asked at the last session about, you know, let's get credit for the cuts that you actually made, we're talking about cuts that you can see in the budget, right, where a line was thirty thousand dollars last year, and now it's ten or it's zero or whatever, and <laughs> it really took a cut. Um, that would be sort of list A, but there's another list B, which is um, the the. And I, I made some reference to it at the last meeting, but I think it falls into a different category of the, you know, six hundred and fifty thousand dollars of capital that Nancy requested that we said no to, and the eight hundred and ten thousand dollars of priority one capital projects that Mrs. Iacona was talking about that didn't get in here that Mr. Cullen uh, desired. And there were similar legitimate requests made by a number of the department heads. And so we will, um, and, I, and these were not pie in the sky, dream up, you know, the wildest thing you've ever thought of. Uh, these would all be justifiable 
the problem is that that budget, when it came out of the chute, was north of 8%. And so this was, you know, a lot of, sorry, you know, that ain't going to fly. So we will create two lists. I'm, this is what I'm if that makes sense to people, we'll create the list where you can actually trace it right in the budget, where you, know, you can see it. And then there's the this didn't make it, but people wanted it list that was legit, but that the superintendent in his um, Solomonic way decided that and didn't want to walk the plank on that one. So that was helpful. Thank you. As a a virtual plank, not an actual plank. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Albin? Just another uh, note. When Dr. Title talked about uh, percentages and of budgets, again, um, the other evening at our meeting, there, uh, the first selectman was commenting on our budget and the fact that budgets around us were smaller in increases than this budget. And at my earlier meeting this uh, today, we went around the table asking what the percentage increases were. Um, we are right there on the money with the other districts. There are many districts that are um, considerably higher than ours. So you can't really talk about uh, budget increases by percentage and compare one town to the next town because the percentage increase in a in a budget in Fairfield and a budget in town A, B, and C around the state um, is really specific to the needs of that town and their circumstances. So just wanted to make that um, that point because uh, we're we're pretty much on the mark with most of the towns. Mr. Carey. To Mrs. Album's point, and I, I did hear the first selectman say the same thing. On um, the last, I think we heard was the superintendent's report in December. The strategic school profiles were uh, there was some snafus in the state. Still snafu'd. Okay. If um, that's so, a those are verb. usually very helpful in getting us to level set. So. Intransitive verb snafu'd. Right. Do we have any type of time frame from them, or is that going to be something where? Gary. Actually, I spoke to the state representative today uh, because I've been calling every week about that. <laughs> Still no word, and they said it won't be for a few more weeks to get last year's as well as entering the data into for this year. And, and that kind of leads me to, <laughs> I guess, something that and we can discuss in more detail on Tuesday, but if we're going to make some comparisons of our uh, local towns, I'm looking at page 5 our budget book and I see that we had a gain in the years 2006, 7, 2007, 2008 and 2008, 2009 of a total increase of $21,079,427 if you add those three numbers. Uh, in 2009-10 we had $50,000 less than the year before. Um, in 2010-11 we had a $2 million increase. So the next three year, if you include the six nine three four four one six, is eight point eight million dollars, less than half of those three years when we had several hundred less students. Um, if we're going to do a comparison with other towns, I'd like to see a three year comparison, not just a one year comparison. Well, uh, yeah, town to town comparisons on superintendents recommended budgets is a bit of an apples to orange comparison for several reasons. Um, one of them is, um, as Mrs. Iacono mentioned, uh, all depends on the status of your employee contracts and what year you're in of what employee contract. And we're on a freeze this year with two employee groups and, you know, other towns may not be. <coughs> Another obviously is the impact on health insurance. It's a big piece of everybody's budget and depending on your experience and, and so forth, that can be a big, you know, chunk. For us, that's a percentage point. You know, in another town, may not even be there. Some towns don't even have to fund a pension. You know, we're, we're kicking in another 400 and something thousand. So there's different factors that go into it. Um, and then there's enrollment. I mean, most towns are declining in enrollment. You know, we are recommending some additional staff to handle some additional enrollment at the middle school and the high school. We know they're coming. Um, that is generally not the case. Um, there's a town near us that's closing a school. You close a school, you can save a lot of money. We ain't closing any schools in the near future. All right? So, and the other thing is, 
you know, some boards, I think this board was pretty clear with me of saying, look, you need to tell us what, you know, within reason, what you need. Right? We don't want you coming in here, cutting back services, slashing and burning to come in with a low number. We want to know what your honest number is. Now, not every superintendent gets that direction. Some superintendents are told, you know, don't come in over this number. We don't care what the damage is. We can't politically support it. And so some, you know, good superintendents, dutiful as we are, we follow directions. And so if a board says to a superintendent, don't come in a nickel over three or your head is on a platter, well, they'll come in with something low. So there's this, you know, the superintendent's recommended number sometimes is a, a, a different kind of a thing. Um, you have to look at, um, you know, what we have that's, that's built into this, that's really out of our control, and, um, you know, where, where that lands us. And that's different in every town. Um, but the one factor that it's not generally a problem in other towns, in fact, it helps them in other towns. One reason towns have been able to come in in, in maybe some other years with lower numbers, because I was doing it in my other district, is enrollment declines. You get enrollment decline, you can reduce staffing positions and not change your service level at all. And you know, we're just not in that position to do it. So it's a bit of an apples to oranges um, comparison for those reasons. Okay, anybody else? All right, so I don't, I don't see anybody else who has any questions or comments. At our next meeting, we're gonna be voting on this. And I just wanna run through the procedure. Um, we'll be voting on this budget. If, if any member has a specific uh, item that they wanna cut or reduce, they should be prepared to do that at the next meeting. And conversely, if any member has a specific item that they wanna add to within this budget, they should be ready to do so. Um, at the next meeting, and we will um, uh, vote on that accordingly. Secondly, and, and our past chairs can help me out on this, we, we vote on this entire budget. I always forget on the capital improvement projects, we do a sense of the body on that. We don't actually vote on that. Okay. No, we, what did we do? No, we are absolutely can vote. We can we voted absolutely. on it last year. Absolutely, and we and actually we should be voting on that. Did, did we yes. vote on it last year? It's been a sense of the body, and then we've taken that information to the Board of Finance that there was a sense of the body. I think we changed um, it last year, but we better but we go could back have in the minutes check. and check. We could have Mrs. Dyer look in the records and tell us how we did it last year. Bev, can you check on a, a year ago? What do we do on the Capitol? If we voted on it, it we need to amend our... I know, but our, I think... Did our, we can add the item two thirds. Um, I think our Mr. Chairman, the history was right or wrong that this was because it was non recurring and, and this was a direction from the town at the time that this is a budget that went directly to the Board of Finance and did not pass through the board. Um, and the reason that this became confusing was probably three years ago, there was a question by one or more members of the Board of Finance, what did the board do with this? And there perhaps was a misunderstanding on the Board of Finance as to the procedure. Um, every once in a while, these things are established in this town without a, a written record as to why they're done this way. And, um, and then, Last year, we may have voted on it. I can't remember, but Mrs. Dyer can, can tell us. And the only reason we would have voted on it was because of that confusion with the Board of Finance. But it perhaps needs to be clarified so we really know how we're supposed to handle it. And it would be nice if it was written down so someone in the future would know how to do it. I, I mean, my recollection is I'm pretty sure we did vote on it uh, because we were pulling things in and out of it. Mm -hmm. um, we had that sheet, and, and um, I, I think it's in our best interest to vote on it so that we can speak to it when we are questioned um, on it. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure, if I'm not mistaken, it, Mrs. Brand did all the research on all yeah, of that. Yeah, there actually were other towns who actually do regularly vote, and that was one thing. And the other thing that it was, uh, I think, the impression of some board members in the past that it was, because it was a capital, that it was then a mandate, and the board cannot mandate funding. But we can request, and it was in, within that same vein, so we were very clear when we're looking for additional space, 
what we are requesting. We're requesting a project, yeah. just where we like with a building, and it's in that same vein. So that's actually why we are doing it, because it really does have to go through here. I think you're right. I think, in fact, I think I did the motion. Mrs. Albert? The, the other issue that needs to be clarified, and um, Mr. Matola, perhaps you can check into it. One of, the, one of the concerns was, and one of the reasons for our not voting on it in the many years since this, since this process was developed back in probably 1999 by then for Selectman uh, John Metsopoulos to fund through this process. Um, prior to that, we didn't fund this way for these projects. Um, this money, we do not have control over this money once it is appropriated by the town, and that was the rationale going all the way back to 1999, um, why we didn't vote on this and why it went directly to the town. Um, because it's actually, in some cases, the projects are administered by the Small Projects Building Committee, which is on the town side. Um, so if you could get some clarification before next Tuesday as to how people on the Board of Finance and the Board of Selectmen want this handled. Okay, well, we will check that. Anything else? Motion, Motion to adjourn. Second. Mrs. Albin, seconded by Mrs. Icono. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.